That's a redback spider, by the way, which is the kind of spider you find where I grew up. Um, they're not very nice, but they, 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 live, they like to live just under the cushions of any outdoor furniture. That's, the, that's their home, and they can send you to hospital. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, just in case you're wondering, redback spider. So, the topic today is about web security. And, you know, as time's gone on, more and more of all of the infrastructure that exists has ended up being based on web technologies. So, 10 years ago, if I wanted to develop some kind of like place where all of the employees in my organization had to store their files and to share files within the organization, we'd be looking at like FTP servers, we might code some kind of um, some server to store that if, we, if, we, if FTP didn't quite fit on our purposes. Maybe we'd look at programming some kind of service that would run on the network. Nowadays, that would be a website, right? Like pretty much whenever we want to build something that we want to make it easy for people to access, um, the, the go-to technology is let's build a website. And there's a few different ramifications of that. One is that the majority of organizations that exist have, well, everyone's got a website, right? Any organization that is even medium sized will have some kind of web presence. But also people tend to want the custom behavior of websites. And because of that, there's a lot of code that gets written by people that don't know what they're doing, basically. There's a lot of dodgily programmed websites that get created by people who kind of understand enough to get things working. And a lot of businesses that just want something on their website, well, can you just build something where they can type in what they want and it just happens or whatever. It's like, oh yeah, don't worry, we can do that. And we'll hire someone to do that. And then you know, they develop the thing. And what it means is rather than everyone having the same software, say for example, everyone's got an FTP server and you know, IRC server and you know, whatever else, People are just inventing stuff. Like, all right, well, let's. If we want files. I can build a website that stores files. No worries. I'll go and code it. So there's a lot of bespoke code in the wild attached to the internet of all places, and so there's there's a lot of vulnerable software that's exposed via websites. Websites are wonderfully accessible, really easy to make look pretty, also easy to make it ugly, but. You know, we, we, you can get someone to program the thing and someone else to come in and make it look nice, do some CSS and make the thing pretty. Uh, and so it, it's a really powerful technology, but it has become one of the focuses of the security industry in terms of, okay, you're doing a security assessment. What's that? You've, you've coded your own website. All right, we're going to have a close look at that because there's a good chance we're going to find a way of breaking it. Um, there are a number of frameworks and content management systems that exist that are basically things upon which websites are built. Uh, and, and sometimes they contain vulnerabilities. So even if you don't make any errors when you're coding the website, if you're building it on a broken technology, it's going to be vulnerable. Um, and there are certain kinds of security um, pitfalls and certain kinds of attacks that work against websites that are different to any other system. So you know things like SQL injection, Vulnerabilities are very, very common on a website uh, and almost never seen on like a C, you know, a, a, a service that's written in C because you just probably, you're not going to be dealing with, with databases in the same way that a website does. So there are certain kinds of things that you need to be aware of in web security and that's what we're going to talk about today. So I think that it's really important that um, we just spend some time covering the basics of how the internet works and how websites work in order to make sure that we're not jumping too far into the deep end without at least just mentioning the basics so that you, you know, to catch everyone up. So I'm guessing there'll be quite a few of you in the room that like know all this stuff really well, you, you know, programmed your own websites and things. And some of this stuff will be like, yeah, okay, I can go to sleep, that's fine. Uh, but also I want to make sure that you all have the, the foundations before we go further, okay? So a website is built on three main technologies. So we've got HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And that's the bedrock of the client, what happens on the client side, right? 
So we load a website up and the first thing to know is that there's HTML code. So the HTML describes the content of what's on the website. Um, it's not about anything else, or it shouldn't be, if it's designed really well, be about anything else. The HTML is about what text, for example, we find on this website. So just looking at this page here, the content is like some text here, there's some more text, and here's some more text. Right? So that's the content. Um, so what, what is actually the, the, the text that's there? Um, and in this example we can see here, um, we've got, a, this is a, a full HTML website that has a, uh, um, so it's got a doc type saying it's HTML at the, fr at the front. X, uh, HTML is basically, um, it's a markup language similar to XML and you have like the start and end of a tag. So we've got everything between the start and end of HTML is the HTML code. We've got the head, which is stuff that doesn't actually get displayed to the user, but it's just information. Um, well, I guess this is the title, which will usually end up in the title bar or the tab across the top of your web browser. It says this is a title. We've got some, um, the body is basically the thing that you see in the browser, like here. Um, we've got heading one. So for example, this is a heading. Uh, it says this is a heading, uh, is heading one, and then there's a paragraph uh, that starts and ends there, and it says hello world, uh, but it's missing the comma because it's not grammatically correct. And um, sorry, and um, so that's there's there's HTML. The thing that goes along with HTML, and it, actually this is relatively recent, believe it or not. Um, so back in the 90s, we didn't have CSS; we just put it all in the HTML. But eventually someone decided, well, why don't we separate the style? The whole point of HTML is to just have the content. Let's pull the style out. And rather than hard coding all of that into the HTML document itself, we'll have a separate file that describes what things look like. Um, and so you've got CSS, which basically describes how the HTML content is presented on the screen. So for example, the fact that this image here uh, takes up this much space. That's like the CSS code at work, saying okay, and rounding these corners and like describing the fonts and all that sort of stuff. That's in CSS. Um, you can actually put put an inline into the HTML still. So you can say like heading one. So this is like in the HTML. You can put style equals, and then you can like basically tag up this specific um, HTML tag. You can, assign this attribute to say the style is the color is red and then the heading will be colored red <coughs> or even better is to not have it in the HTML at all and have it in a separate file in a CSS file that basically says okay like here's a list of all of our styles let's just make all headings so all heading ones the color red that's much better because now we've got a separate place that describes what it looks like and we've got all of our content in the HTML document right um, now, from a security perspective, I guess the more interesting one is JavaScript. So the third piece of this puzzle is, so we've got the content, the textual content, what it looks like, and the JavaScript is the thing that makes it dynamic, um, and it makes it interactive and so that you can click on things and it responds to events. Um, and all modern web browsers include a JavaScript engine um, based on the ECMAScript specification. So which is basically just to say there is like a, a um, specification that says what JavaScript does. Uh, and then there's a bunch of different implementations and each web browser has its own JavaScript engine that runs and interprets the JavaScript code and does stuff. Um, JavaScript is weakly and dynamically typed uh, programming language, which means that when you've got a variable, you can put a string into it. And then on your next line of code, you could put a number into it and the JavaScript's not gonna complain. You can basically just do all kinds of crazy stuff that other programming languages like Java or C or C++ wouldn't let you do. It would just be like, that's the wrong data type. You can't put a number there. This is for strings or this, well, this is for a character. JavaScript is just like, do whatever you want and then when you actually try and use that variable, it'll try and figure out what you're trying to do, which in itself has some weird security um, consequences. But, um, also, you can actually execute new JavaScript that happens to be sat in a string as JavaScript. 
So you could have a string that has some JavaScript in it, and you can basically run that as JavaScript from your JavaScript. So you do your kind of basically at runtime, it can just run more JavaScript. So for example, if you let some a user type something in and you display it into your code, if the thing they type in is some JavaScript code, if you're not careful what's happening, their code is going to end up running inside the website uh, on everyone's computers, which is um, does anyone know what kind of security vulnerability that is? Cross-site Yeah, cross-site scripting. So it's really easy to have those kinds of, um, of errors. Um, and JavaScript can actually modify the environment in various ways, including the DOM. So let's uh, just look at a basic example. So here's, here's a website that um, you know, just, ha just has the text before in it. We can quite easily add some JavaScript that just replaces the content of the website. Uh, and then the JavaScript can basically just do anything on the website, include, in this example, replace the entire HTML content of the website. So just as an example, the JavaScript can basically do anything. The JavaScript can, um, can, can modify every picture to flip it upside down if it wants to. It can do, well, the JavaScript is just part of the website and it can change anything about the website while it's running. So if a user can insert JavaScript into a website, they can change the whole way that website behaves. So if you are um, you know, on the client side, so with cross-site scripting, you end up basically making the website uh, act differently. And that's like an attack that one user could do it against another user on that system, for example. So the DOM is, um, so the document object model is like the internal model of what's happening inside the web browser is it loads up an HTML document and it loads all of the parts of that document into its own internal representation of what that document is, which is the DOM. Um, and actually, you can do something on a web browser. So on web, uh, if you right click in, the, in Firefox or Chrome and click inspect, you can actually see here like a, a um, representation of the DOM. So you can see here, so on this website, um, which is the slides, there's a heading here, which says DOM, there's a picture there, and then here there's a div, and inside that div, there's an unordered list, and inside that list, there's these items. And, like H2, um, and so JavaScript can actually modify this stuff on the fly. So similar to this, right? So JavaScript could come along, edit that, and then next thing you know, your website's displaying something different. Um, so JavaScript can, just like I just modified that, can get in and modify any part of the DOM, um, which will, can basically just change the content of the website. So the architecture of the web is, uh, traditionally, it's a client-server model. Um, and by back in the day, it all happened on port 80 and HTTP, um, and there's not encrypted. Nowadays, we try to use um, like encrypted communication more often because there's a bunch of reasons for that. Um, <coughs> one of which that we're more confident that our um, communications aren't being tampered with, less likely someone's listening in on everything that we're doing, um, and you know, and a bunch of other reasons. But basically, we use encrypted via um, public key infrastructure, so SSL or TLS. Um, on port 443. And basically, you have a client, uh, which might be your, your phone or your, lap, your laptop or desktop computer. You browse the internet, so there's a web browser running on your thing. It basically goes over the internet and does, you know, the message is routed across the internet, makes its way to the server, and um, makes its request, and then the server fulfills that request and sends it back to the client, is the traditional way that websites work. And so, so hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, is a request response protocol. Uh, it's, an app, it's on the application layer. So it sits on top of TCP uh, and does its communication backwards and forwards. So TCP is the stuff that actually gets the packets from your computer to the other computer. Uh, it is the layer on top of that. So it just can send, okay, here's some HTML uh, and the headers and sends it across the network. And TCP does the actual getting it from place A to place B. Um, and so the client, so for example, the web browser connects to the server and it makes a request and it does that by sending 
usually two lines of text. It says, the, so literally it sends this text. It'll say get uh, index.html, for example, if you're trying to get the, the main page from a website. And then it says what version of the protocol it understands. So for example, HTTP uh, 1.1. And it says what host it's trying to access. So I think you're um, example.com or leadsbecker.ac.uk. Uh, why do we? Why does it have to say what server it thinks it's connecting to? Like, does the server not know itself what, what it is? is? Is there any? Is there any reason why a computer would a server would be confused when you connect to the port uh, about what website it should be loading up? Yeah, so a so website can be multi-tenant. So, so for example, my website is hosted on the same server that hosts a bunch of other people's websites. And so connecting to the IP address by itself, for example, you wouldn't know what website it was after. So it says like in the, the headers of what's sent, this is the website I expect, I expect you to be. And the server then looks and goes, oh, yeah, I am that website. Cool. I know how to do that. Uh, and it accesses that page, and it will send it back. So the, res the server responds with basically a bunch of headers like this, and then the actual content of the um, that it's sending. So in this case, it's just sending a website back. So this is like an example page, and it's like a simple document. Um, and here, the, the first thing that the server responds back with is a response code saying 200, which means, OK, it's all fine. Yeah, I can do that. And if there was some kind of error that occurred, it would instead of saying 200, it would have some error code. Uh, that would tell you why it failed, so you don't have permission or whatever other reason. And there's a bunch of other information, including what server it's running as, so an Apache server, for example, uh, and, and a bunch of other stuff. So if you want to, you can actually do all this via Netcat. So you can literally just like fire up Netcat, connect directly to port 80, and just type in the request and hit enter twice, and it will literally just give you the, the app. It'll respond back and give you that um, that text that would be sent to a web browser. So, this, so like, it's not that hard to understand what a web browser is doing. Basically, it's just doing this. It connects to port to whatever port it's doing. It sends the request and it gets sent this back. Now, with this information, it then builds up a DOM and then uses a rendering engine to basically put it on the website for you, onto your browser for you, so you can see it. Um, and that, that's essentially at its heart what the web is. But things have got more complicated because, uh, you know, thing you know we're not serving up static web pages anymore. Because originally, the website, the web, so in the 90s when I first experienced the the the, the internet and the web, and I was googling Nirvana guitar tabs, the you know and you slowly load a picture, like if you're lucky it would load a picture and then just have some text, and the 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 internet was just static HTML documents. It would just, the server would just say, oh, this is the file you want. Get the file, send it across the network. Oh, no, I want another file now because I've clicked the link. I'll send that across the internet, and you wait another five minutes, and it'll come up with some more text. Um, but things have changed, right? So now people expect websites to be interactive. They want to be able to do fancy things with them. And to the point where when we're writing new software, it ends up being a website. So it's become more and more interactive to the point where it's just software as much as it is content. Um, so yeah, so then Web 2.0 came along and they liked to, you know, I think everyone thought they were being really cool by calling it 2.0. Um, and things were interactive and now you've got Web 3.0 or 4.0, whatever the hell, I don't know. But basically, as time's gone on, things have changed. So at first, we ended up with a lot of code starting to appear on the server side. So rather than it just serving up a text document, which was an HTML document, it would basically, you know, originally it'd be CGI scripts, uh, so there'd be like Perl scripts or, or whatever else. And then over time, you had programming languages like PHP and Java that were basically, it's code running on the server side and it will dynamically build those HTML documents for you as you're interacting with the website. So the server will say, okay, I'll build you some HTML using my PHP, uh, and I'll serve you that. So depending on what user's logged in, 
and what you've clicked on, I'm going to build a new set of content and send that across to your web browser. So most of the logic and hard work was still happening on the server side, so that you know with this initial move to websites doing more stuff. But as time's gone on, you know JavaScript obviously has some interaction, and so like when you hover over something and a menu appears, and then you take the mouse off and it disappears, that's often JavaScript code doing those sorts of things and, or anything else that's com more complicated than that. But as time's gone on, more and more stuff's been offloaded to the client as well. So now you've got a whole bunch of code happening on the server side, generating stuff, but you've also got a whole bunch of code on the client side within the web browser doing a bunch of stuff. So it, you know, almost to the point where you can have full applications that are running in your web browser. Um, that are basically lo sitting on your local system. The initial files loaded off the server, but at this point, basically, all everything's happening on your computer uh, until it needs to ask the server for something. And so there's like, depending on the website, there'll be a different breakdown of where all the work's happening. Sometimes it's all happening in your browser. Sometimes it's basically all happening on the server. Um, and then there's where do you store the stuff? So we have databases to actually store all of the information. So you know, the, you're typing a text file in a website, it needs to be stored somewhere. So typically you have a, a, um, like a SQL database sitting on the server side and you click submit on the client and it sends it across the internet to the server and it gets stored in the database. But nowadays you can even have local databases in a website where they're stored client side. So HTML5 actually supports the website actually storing locally on your computer um, stuff. So it can have local databases and remote databases. So, you know, it's kind of a complicated picture. Um, and then, because JavaScript is so important to everything now, uh, to, to websites and the way they behave, there are all these different JavaScript libraries that exist that can make JavaScript even more powerful and can make it easier to develop code. So for example, jQuery makes it a lot of shortcuts, basically. You can look at jQuery as being JavaScript with like loads of helper functions. You can do what you would used to have to do in JavaScript in five lines of code, it becomes one line of code. Uh, it has some little graphical things that it can do for you. So you want a tabbed interface, has support for that. And then you've got newer frameworks like AngularJS and React and, and Vue.js, and they will basically completely change the way that websites are built. So they give you whole new paradigms for building websites, so that basically all more and more and more of the logic is client side, to the point where the server can become nothing more than um, ba basically just responding back with some data not building any of the actual websites, just here you go, oh, you want some information, here's some information. And then all the work ends up happening in the web browser itself. Um, and it's not necessarily as far as that, but this is what some of these things allow you to do. And you end up with single page web apps, um, where basically you've got a whole website that never actually changes a site, like it never actually has to load the whole page because instead it's asking the server for the bits that it needs and it's all happening inside the web browser. So, uh, so yeah. And one of the technologies it uses to do that is known as AJAX, um, which stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, even though nowadays most of that communication is not using XML. Usually it's using JSON. <coughs> basically, it allows a website to, but basically it's some JavaScript that's running and make an AJAX query against the server, say, give me something or other, say for example, give me a list of all the users on the system, and the server says, okay, here's a list of the users, and then that gets sent back to the JavaScript, and then the JavaScript need, um, then uses that information to build the website that you're looking at, or to update parts of the page that you're looking at, rather than updating the whole thing. Um, because before AJAX, you would basically have full page refreshes, where you click a button, and it would have to load a whole new page. Whereas after AJAX, you click the button and it causes the server and client to talk to each other uh, without loading the pages, just like the JavaScript then just updates the content of the DOM on the fly. And so it's like you're interacting with an interactive piece of software, or you are, without it having to load a whole new page every time. 
So JavaScript, you know, as I've mentioned, can modify the environment in the DOM, um, but there are some security measures in place to try and limit the kinds of like problems that are associated with that. So you can think of JavaScript as sort of running in a sandbox in that it's running in the web browser and it can't get to your operating system resources without some user interaction. So like a piece of JavaScript running in a website can't just access all of your files, right? That you have to prompt you for that to like open a file, for example. So that's good. Um, there's also some protection called same origin policy, which will stop the scripts on the different tabs that you've got open and the different websites you're browsing from just accessing each other. Like you, one website can't just access the DOM of another website unless it's the same website that you've got open. So if, if you've opened up two different websites on two different URLs, those two tabs can't just like access all the data out, out of each other because that would be disastrous if like, you know, if a, um, if your to-do app can update your bank balance, that's not good, right? Like that would be a serious security flaw. Um, but a lot can go wrong and sometimes these things fail. So sometimes there are ways that the same origin policy ends up being subverted. Um, and obviously things like cross-site cross scripting where JavaScript ends up doing something that you don't want it to do. Um, I mentioned content management systems at the start. So a content management system server side, and it's basically a framework for building websites. So for example, WordPress, which amazingly, to me it seems amazing, makes up 29% of the internet is built on, on um, WordPress, which blows my mind. But um, so like loads of websites on the internet are built off, built off Word, um, WordPress. Um, uh, Joomla, Drupal, Sitefinity, there's a bunch of other content management systems you can, you can get. A lot of them are free and open source. Um, for whatever reason, most of them are written in PHP. Um, and they, they're designed to let non-technical people create and manage a website. Because you can basically log into uh, WordPress and say, give me a new website, click a button. All right, well, give me a heading, click. OK, want some text, click. I'm going to type my text in, click, and click, 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 click. Save that to the database. And it just like does all the work. And so it allows someone who's not a programmer, you know, you don't need to understand what HTML is to create a website in WordPress, for example. Um, but they are expen expan extendable. There are a bunch of extensions and plugins for WordPress, for example, to add like a shopping cart to the website. Uh, or to add a, an image gallery and to add all these different things. And so there's like a whole bunch of extensions that are available that are, are, are also programmed uh, by, you know, just random people on the internet that have submitted them. And uh, so people start using these different extensions. Um, but content management systems and extensions, just like any other code, can include vulnerabilities, and they have done in the past. So for example, WordPress, there have been critical security vulnerabilities in old versions of older versions of WordPress, and loads of extensions have been found to have security vulnerabilities in them. So um, then that 29% of the internet that's running on WordPress, when there is a security vulnerability in WordPress, suddenly a loads of servers become vulnerable, and so they need to patch quickly. Um, there is w uh, WP scan which is a tool like on Kali Linux, so you can download it, um, for scanning WordPress sites for common vulnerabilities, including like versions that are vulnerable, but also like insecure configurations. Um, and you know, so you can test your server using that. Um, so in addition to like servers that are basically hosting websites, servers and I kind of alluded to this before when I was talking about AJAX queries, can do machine to machine interactions as well. So a web service is basically, has like an interface to query a database and it will basically respond back. Uh, so a lot of mobile apps that you have installed on your phone, for example, will be talking to the same APIs as the website is when you load the website. So on the back end, there's a bunch of like APIs that are on the basically on the internet, and you use the web, the the mobile app. You click a button, and it talks to the same API to that same web service 
as when you actually load your web browser and go to their website. And then internally, when you, when you click on something in the website, um, depending on how it's structured, it might be happening on the server side or the client side, but it will use those same APIs to talk to that backend database. And one of the most common types of, inter types of interfaces are RESTful APIs. So, uh, so basically, the way it works is it's via standard HTTP uh, and you use get, put, post, and delete um, uh, messages to basically access a database via some source, you know, some code. Um, the APIs um, that will then respond back, usually in JSON or XML, to, to give the results. So then the website, which might be like React. JS or, or Vue or Angular JS might be all running inside your web browser. You click a thing, it talks to the RESTful API, and it returns back into that web browser which does most of the work. Um, equally, your mobile app, you click a thing, and it talks by the RESTful API to the server. Server responds back to the mobile app, and then the app does the work to represent that on the screen. So. Some of the problems, some of the, the vulnerabilities in websites include like vulnerabilities in frameworks that I mentioned, um, like uh, and content management systems. So there, because so much of the website is made of bespoke code, there's lots of opportunities for programming mistakes. Um, some of the most common errors that people make is mistrust uh, in like misplaced trust in the client or the servers or the users. So for example, the server trusts the information coming from the client uh, that, that it makes sense without checking what's coming. But then the client is actually someone typing in, sending through some SQL code, for example, it would be a SQL injection. Or the, um, the client mistrusting what came from the server. Um, and for example, it might be some code that some other user has injected into the database that is some JavaScript, and then the client loads that straight up onto the screen. Um, so the, the other kinds of vulnerabilities are actually implementation errors in the web browser um, or in the sandbox. Um, and there are also a number of like security mistakes that are commonly found on websites. So how many of you guys have heard of the OWASP top 10 before? Can I just see some hands? So yes, great. So the OWASP top 10, so OWASP is an organization um, that is all about web security. And uh, you know, they're, they're a fantastic resource. If you go to the OWASP website, it, there, there is just like information about um, like, every, so yeah, there's so much information there that's very useful. Um, and you know, we're, we're using a bunch of OWASP tools uh, um, and resources. <clears throat> um, but one of those things that they do is they release a list of what they consider to be the top 10 security vulnerabilities in websites. Um, and they've updated that list um, fairly recently, so in 2017. So you can see here, the last time they did the exercise was in 2013. So there are some changes that have happened over time. Um, but you can see, you know, there, there are a bunch of things like injection is, is like the biggest one. So that's things like SQL injection, broken session management and authentication, <coughs> cross site scripting. Um, there's like misconfigurations, and you know, so there's a bunch of using components with known vulnerabilities, which comes down to the, you know, what I was just talking about with CMSs. Um, and throughout the um, Throughout the next five weeks, we will look at a lot of these uh, in a bit more detail and understand these um, security vulnerabilities that happen in websites. But if you're interested, it's a good read. Uh, basically, there's a short uh, introduction to each of those things. If you um, load the, the top 10 PDF document, you can actually read through. Um, so one of the techniques that we use in web security um, is using a web proxy, which you guys have all done now because you've done the first week of labs already. Um, but basically it allows you to get between the client and the server so that you can see everything that's passing in either direction and actually modify things. So you can say, well, what happened if the client 
re responded back to something the server doesn't expect, um, which is the first week's exercise, where you're basically modifying what the client's sending. And if the server's not being careful about checking that that makes sense, uh, then you know that is, a, you know, a security problem. Um, but the the proxy is important for us to be able to test that. It's what happens when you've got a misbehaving client or server? There are automated tools that you can use that will scan a website for security vulnerabilities. So, for example, uh, like Burp Suite and and Zap both have the ability to basically point point it at a URL, and it will try and automate a bunch of stuff to try and find security problems for you. Um, there's there's also uh, W3AF uh, and Nikto, which uh, also do similar things. They'll look at a website and try and find configuration errors, or um, you know, it'll try and fuzz test a server to try and find um, whether it's vulnerable to certain kinds of security problems. And a lot of these tools also have a spider built in, so if you, which allow you to basically crawl a website to download the content. Um, if you've got a dynamic website, a spider is only going to give you kind of the HTML version of that website. Like, what if we pull down the content and it will give you a bunch of HTML documents or it will download the contents off that website so that you can look at it in more detail. Um, and some <laughs> spiders will even do things like tell you what version of the frameworks are running, whether there's any interesting content and things like that. So. Automated scans are fine, and they might find some obvious things, and it's not a bad place to start. But manual testing is required in order to find anything that's not obvious. Basically, in order for you to actually try and test a security website, like it helps to basically be able to get in there and try and modify the queries and see you know, what comes back. Um, so there is also a thing worth thinking about, which is the fact that when you're, when you're actually talking to a live server and injecting a bunch of stuff into it to try and break it, there's, not a, there's, a, there's a decent chance that you're actually going to break something. You might break, break a website, for example. So it is worth being aware that that, you know, that, that can happen. Um, there are tools like Metasploit Pro and Nextflows have web scanning features. Um, and Metasploit actually can, can um, ha, has exploit payloads so that you know not only does it will give you access to the database, but it will try and actually give you shell on that server. So there's you know I think a lot of people don't think of the fact that some web security vulnerabilities can actually result in shell access, not just access to the contents of the website. So in conclusion, web security is important, uh, and it's only getting more important as time's gone on. There's lots of technology involved, and I've just introduced you to a bunch of them. I think that some of you probably knew quite a lot of that already before this lecture, but I hope that you found it useful to kind of get that overview of the technologies that are involved in the big picture before we go in and start talking about some specific security problems. Um, there are automated tools that you can use, and it will find some obvious things, but if you want to do more sophisticated testing, then it helps to actually get in there and actually look at what's happening and try and understand what the website's actually doing. Um, and we've talked about um, using web proxies as well.